Um, the last speaker for today and for the whole conference is uh, Tom O'Brien, and he will talk about verification. All right, well, thank you all for sticking around. Um, and thanks for the, the invitation, and, and thanks to the organizers of the conference for yeah, really holding quite an excellent conference. And it's nice to be finally back and seeing people in person. Uh, I want to tell you today about error mitigation. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about some stuff that's maybe a little bit older. I want to tell you about some stuff that's a bit more recent, a little bit old. Um, I want to tell you a bit about some new links between the di between multiple different error mitigation techniques that have been made and some stuff that's actually new to this talk. Um, I want to, yeah, I guess um, I want to tell you a bit about some of the error mitigation techniques that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I would say I don't think that they've gotten uh, enough attention, which is why I'm talking about them. Um, I also think that some of the error, that some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, I've given many talk I've given a couple of talks on before and I always seem to do a very bad job of explaining so that being so with that being said uh please ask any questions um and I'm gonna try to stop and repeat myself when I see your faces like really glaze over uh, and here's just a list. this is a non -com this is a non-comprehensive list of all of the uh, all of my co-authors and all of the papers that I'm going to misrepresent um all right so I'm going to talk about yeah, three, three types of error mitigation, kind of four types of error mitigation, but let's just, there's three on the outline slide, so we'll stick with that. I'll start with symmetry verification. I'm going to then move on to uh, an error mitigation technique that's incredibly poorly named because we pulled it out of the phase estimation community, but we want to rename it. And so I'm actually using this talk as a way of spruiking that. So we're going to rename it to error verification, echo verification, due to its uh, likeness to a logic echo. Uh, then I'm going to talk about virtual distillation. Then there's some very nice results from silos about the link between virtual distillation and echo verification. I'll extend some of those results a little bit, and I'll talk about some of the issues that we have with implementing these on a real device. Okay, so error mitigation, why? Well, quantum circuits are noisy. Noise is probably the biggest challenge that we face towards doing anything in quantum computing, let alone in this. Um, and I guess, you know, put things into perspective here, like the error rates that we have on today's devices are somewhere between 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus three per gate. Here are the error measurements that were taken on the day when the 2019 Beyond Classical Experiment was run. Um, depending on who you talk to, those numbers will go up and go down. And I think those numbers always go up when you go from like isolated single qubits to actual real devices that, you know, with, with, with like 20, 30 plus, plus qubits. Now, the other problem we have with quantum computing is that classical computers have about an 80 year head start. And so in order to give, do anything, to, you know, in order to like solve, say, you know, problems in even material science and chemistry, which are probably the closest that we have to quantum hardware, to actually beat classical competition, you quite often got to aim around for like 10 to the minus three error in estimating expectation value. Maybe 10 to the minus two, maybe 10 to the minus three, these numbers are just approximate, but you know, if you look at the, the, the again, the 2019 experiment, this is a, oh, yeah, this is just a, a, a nice number down the bottom, which was they didn't have 10 to the minus error per 10 to the minus three error per circuit. They had 10 to the minus three circuit fidelity. That's the wrong way around. So we need to invert that somehow, right? <laughs> that six orders of magnitude to get past. It's, it's, it's tough work. Now, there is a, there is a, a, a path towards success, and there have been some great talks uh, um, like during this conference on progress in error, in error correction, and we are pushing towards a you know, large million so order qubit quantum device, which we can do really fun things with, but we don't have that yet. And so in the meantime, when we don't have scalable error correction, we say, okay, well, what can we throw away that we can actually do? Well, let's throw away scalability. And this leaves us with a class of protocols, which are roughly known as error mitigation, and error mitigate, and if I want to give the, the broadest definition I give, I can say it's anything that you can do now that doesn't scale, because if you could do it now and it was scalable, well, then we'd be very happy. Um, there's a more, I guess, a more rigorous definition, which I want to credit more to Sai than uh, uh, to, to Denny Sai than, than anybody else, is that if I have a unitary U, an observable O, and then I replace that unitary with its real circuit information, yeah, I replace U with its noisy, you know, noisy version, let's call that R. And then I have some state which is R applied to the identity. The question is, can I extract the noisy, like the, the, the noiseless expectation value from the state given, given O? So I'm not allowed to really do anything to row. Um, I'm just allowed to like run an estimator on it, right? 
you know, that, that, that's, I guess, how we, how we are thinking about things in our mitigation, but really, you know, the, the number of techniques you can use to actually extract this get quite large. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, I'm not going to talk about everything on this, uh, all possible forms of error mitigation. This talk, I'm going to focus on, I guess, two to three kind of classes. One of the oldest forms of error mitigation, one of the simplest forms, and probably one of the dumbest forms, which is why we like it, is, is, um, is called what we call it symmetry verification. That name is due to Javier Bonet, the, third, the first author on our paper. Somehow it's stuck. Um, otherwise known as post selection for people who aren't pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's inherited from quantum error correction, okay, which is just, I have, suppose I have a, a, a circuit that I'm running and I'm preparing a state with that circuit, so go back, you know, the row that I was preparing or the side that I was trying to protect for, I know it satisfies it's some symmetry S, and what that means is I have an operator, I know this, I have an operator S, and I know that psi is going to be an eigenstate of this operator. All right, well then there's a very simple, a very simple um, error mitigation technique, which is I measure symmetry S, and then I say, well, I don't have the resources to correct my state if it's wrong, because that requires a lot of qubits. Instead, I'm just going to throw the data away. Now, this doesn't scale because, you know, the, you, you, I don't have any choice. I don't have any recourse except throwing everything away. And so then if I just allow myself to accumulate error, then roughly the, and even if I increase the number of symmetries, then the chance I have of passing every single check is going to decrease exponentially. I'm just going to wind up throwing away all of my experiments and I don't get any data. Um, but for small scale experiments, it kind of works. Here's like the here is our attempt at doing this in like in theory simulations down the bottom right hand side. I guess I want to you know to point out here you can use natural or artificial symmetries. Um, you know probably the, the most the nicest symmetry to use is like the number operator or like the spin or spin symmetry. Um, but you can also introduce some and you can rotate your system and you can uh, and you can you know you can you can um, yeah rotate your system and and. Play, play tricks with your error model to actually make the system uh, more amenable to error mitigation. But the nice thing down here on the right hand side, where we managed to go from a two qubit system, sorry about the, sorry about the, the, the porn location, the thing you should see, it's, it's, in, it's working a bit out of sense, unfortunately. Yeah, if you look at the, 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 bottom, the bottom purple uh, squares, it, sorry, or the bottom, sorry, the bottom red diamonds is a two qubit experiment using error mitigation. Then we introduced an additional symmetry. This is on a hydrogen molecule. We introduced some, uh, two additional symmetries to go to four qubits. We rotated the Hamiltonian. We reperformed the error mitigation. You find that the error, like even though you're running on four qubits with a much longer circuit, you can actually improve the, the mitigation power of your, of your circuit, which is kind of nice. Um, what else to do? Another thing, the reason why we called it verification actually had there is actually a reason, and that is that you can do you can do um, the, 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 the post selection either directly or indirectly. Now, the circuit I have up here on the, on the, on the top right is actually, that's how you do a direct measurement of any poly symmetry. I rotate my state into that poly basis. I C not at all of the qubits with an ancilla, and then I rotate them out. That's incredibly costly if you're on a quantum computer, especially if you're using superconducting hardware and you're locally coupled. So what people tend to do is they tend to cheat. Um, one cheat that you can do, which is kind of nice, is you can actually you can actually just read out all of your qubits either with the symmetry applied or without the symmetry applied, and then you can estimate. You can actually do every all of this, um, the the verification post processing, which is where these results down the bottom. And that's kind of important because especially when we were doing this in the first the first small experiments, we ran into the problem where the measurement circuit, which is not immune, like not like mitigated at all, can introduce more errors than you're actually taking away from the so, all right. So that's back in that. That was that's um. So that that's like the you know, the symmetry verification. And then I think uh, this is kind of like become a standard experimental technique. I think now when we talk to experimentalists, every time they're looking for a symmetry, and if they don't have a symmetry, they're a bit scared that the, you know they're not going to be able to do any mitigation at all, and their the results are terrible. Um, here's a bunch of papers. So the, the top right is like the first experimental realization of this, which was out of um, the Di Carlo lab in Delft. Which is who we did the original collaboration with. Um, now, down at the bottom, there are three works that I've vaguely participated in uh, where, where this has also occurred. There's been some work on this, is on simulating the Hubbard model. Down at the right is indeed the, the science paper from 20, 2018 doing thermodynamic linear optics. Um, and on the left hand side is, is Ashley's work uh, from early this year looking at the Hubbard model. Um, I will say, like, so. The, the thing to note is that if, the, if you, you saw from the earlier slide, when we ran this in theory, we were predicting something like about an order of magnitude improvement in error, which is kind of, you know, it was nice and for the experiments at the time, this was like looking like a really great idea. 
Um, and I think this has but mostly been matched an experiment. Um, I think also people have figured out that you don't just need to do, uh, you don't just need to do like post left on symmetries. You should also try to rescale to cancel out some of the completely incoherent depolarizing noise. And one of the, but one of the nice things about this uh, as an error mitigation technique, it just plays really well with it. Uh, and so I think, you know, this, this can be seen in, in both the, uh, the Fermi Hubbard results, as you see, they go from post selection to bouquet calibration and then to rescaling. And for, for Ashley's paper as well, they managed to mix multiple, we, we managed to mix multiple symmetries, so well, Ashley instead and Stasio and, and, and say spacecraft management, multiple symmetries with um, with with rescaling and then get everything to work really well. So that's kind of nice. Um, also, I should point out that the circuits have evolved a lot since the things I showed on the previous slide. This, I think, uh, was due to, in a, a large part of this, was Nick Rubin pointing out that uh, at least for a, um, for a fermionic system, it's quite easy to rotate yourself into a basis where you're measuring your entire like one and two reduced density matrix simultaneously with your number operator. Uh, this is a lot far, this is a lot better than, than what we were proposing to do originally or what you know other people were proposing to do originally. And it's uh, been been one of the reasons why this is this worked so well. Um, okay, cool. And so now let me move on to echo verification. New name used to be called verified phase estimation, if you if you uh, remember from the intro. And this is kind of where I want to. I, I want to just, you know, this is where I always have a hard time explaining it. So let me go through this in detail. If you want to get, if I want anyone to get anything out of this talk, it's a better understanding of how this technique works. Now, let me motivate the technique by giving an advertisement, which is, you know, we were getting a fat order of 10 reduction from measuring, you know, symmetries that projects myself onto roughly half of the Hilbert space. I guess if you're measuring the number operator, it's slightly less than half, but, you know, but still leaving a large chunk of your Hilbert space where errors can occur. That you can kind of still stay in, but your, your symmetries don't detect. So the question is, can we do any better than this? So the technique I'm going to propose doesn't just project me onto like half the Hilbert space, or like a quarter of the Hilbert space. It projects me on everything, but it projects away all of my Hilbert space except a single qubit. And the trick is to hide the information that you want within that single qubit. How do we do this? Okay, so this is the generalized Hadamard test. It's a nice way of measuring um, an observable O. I need O to be a unitary. Um, but also an observable. So, you know, for instance, it could be a single poly operator. You could also make this ETIHT, in which case you do a phase estimation, which is where the name verified phase estimation came from. Um, but the idea is so, so here I get my say O, oh, and then U is the, the box which prepares the state I'm interested in. Okay. And really, I want to put all the hardest of the problem really into U. So this would be, say, for example, some variational ansatz or whatever, whatever you want that can prepare your state. Now, I said O, I mean, honestly, O, we, we've actually got follow-up work that unfortunately isn't out yet, but we're finding that really the, for, for the sake of measuring expectation values, um, you really just want this O to be like a single a single poly operator. So this circuit by contrast is actually quite small, but I'm just gonna keep it the same size because you know, it's easy to see in the slide. Now, if I prepare my uh, ancillary cube in the plus state, and then I measure, I, I, I do a controlled operation of O, you can actually see this. The, if, you, if you do the math, I tried to keep the math on the slide for a minimum. If you do the math, the expectation value of O gets pulled into the off diagonal of the density matrix, or rather, you know, you, you pick up something which looks like zero plus one, um, I didn't like, sorry, zero plus one times the expectation value of O. I can measure this out by reading out the, the X value of here. If my unitary, if my unitary is actually a complex number, I also need to measure this in the Y basis. And so I'm measuring the expectation value on the ancilla qubit of X. This encodes the expectation value of O down here. Now, when I say I'm measuring, this is kind of like a crucial part. What do I mean when I'm measuring? I repeat this experiment many, many times, right? This measurement returns me not many values of, of, of if it, this, this measurement doesn't return me immediately. It either, because X has eigenvalues of plus or minus one, every time I get a plus one or a minus one, and I average those plus ones and I average those minus ones to get the expectation value that I desire. So far, so good. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question, can I post-select on the system register being in zero? Because previously, I was just throwing that away, right? Now, and the, the, this is kind of surprising because if I measure the system register being in zero, well, I have a very good reason to believe that the system register may no longer be in the starting state. Namely, I've just done something to it. Right, I've just applied this, this unitary here. However, there's a cool trick where, where what you can say is, I can say that, so, so remember before, if I was, uh, what I do is, after I do this Hadamard test, I just read this guy off and I take a series of plus one and minus one measurements. 
Now, if I unprepare my state and measure it in a zero basis, and I don't get back zero, I know that this operator is applied. Right? I know that something's actually happened in between the U and the U dagger. If I know that operator was applied, I know the control cube was in the one state. And if I take the one state and I measure it in the X basis, I know I'm going to get that expectation value of zero. So I can divide the, start, the set of experiments that I run, the set of data that I get, into two fractions. The fraction where I do measure where this does return to zero, and the fraction where this doesn't return to zero. And for the fraction of experiments where this measurement doesn't return, it, where this measurement down here on the state register, when this doesn't return to zero, I can take all of the plus or minus one measurements from X, and I know that if I keep taking those measurements continuously, they're going to average out to zero, regardless of regardless of what my operator was, regardless of what my state was. And all of the information that actually gives me the expectation value of O is hidden in the, the, set, of, the set of measurements that goes to the, 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 sorry, the did return to zero. Now, I want to point out that crucially, I'm, not, I'm replacing the measurement, a plus or minus one measurement with a zero here. I'm not actually post-selecting. This is important because A, it means I'm not, I'm not actually throwing away any information in principle. Um, and B, you know, like this is important when you go and do a real experiment with this, it's really important to actually, uh, you know, to, to not, not like discard that data because you'll divide out by the wrong number when you take the average. Let me talk a little bit about what happens when I, when I, when I put noise in here. So any error that scatters, so, so yeah, so now, now I go to noise. And this is where I was talking, saying, mentioning before about kind of projecting the, or, or, or doing, managing to, to verify and throw away data on like all but a, all but like a dimension two subspace of my two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. The idea is that if I get an error that scatters my state to any orthogonal state, right? So if I get an error in this circuit that does anything that, that doesn't like, you know, keep me, that doesn't keep me returning to zero, right? Then any bias that, that, I, that I get in my, in my measurement, in this measurement of O is gonna get replaced by, by just zero, right? So the point being, I said, in the absence of errors, the fraction of results that return to something other than zero at the end is going to average out to zero in this expectation value of X. In the presence of errors, that's no longer true, but I'm going to throw that set away anyway. And what that does is it unbiases my noise, right? So if it's unbiasing my noise, I still now, it's unbiasing my noise. So now suddenly, like, I've still shrunk my expectation value. Right, I still shrunk this measurement. I still replaced a lot of what, in the absence of error, would actually be signal with now they're just zeros. But the cool thing here is I get a rescaling for free. And this is, I think, really the power of this technique is if what I can do, I can pull this O out of here, right? And just chuck it straight out. And then, and especially if this operator is quite small, right? Like it's a single poly operator, I have a Lockschmidt echo, which I can use to get a very accurate measure of my fidelity. And it looks exactly like the circuit I'm actually doing. Now, this is a crucial, this is a crucial step because how, uh, putting in a Lockschmidt echo in principle, so using rescaling by a Lockschmidt echo, um, in principle, this runs on the idea that if I have an incoherent noise channel, then the fidelity of U, U dagger is going to be the fidelity of U squared. But if I have a coherent noise channel, this isn't necessarily the case, and a Lockschmidt echo can become a bad estimate of fidelity. But in our case, the Lockschmidt echo I get from, from removing this operator O is actually really close to the true fidelity because the only difference is, is, is actually quite small because the separate is quite small. So it works out. So that's echo, that's echo verification uh, with, with control. Now I do want further because it's nice to be able to remove control qubits, because especially when you start, like, you know, start controlling a big box O. And I'm going to talk about echo verification without control. And the trick is you do this, the, you, in the, the idea is I replace the control. I kind of put it on the first qubit here. Okay, I'm not hiding anything. I'm actually saying he's throwing away one qubit. But what you're, what you're doing now is I'm saying I'm controlling the preparation rather than controlling the, um, rather than controlling the unitary. So what I do here is I replace, it, I replace this unitary with a control preparation. This requires that I have that my, so this requires that my unitary, which previously prepared psi from zero, now also prepares a state phi from the state one, where one is just this guy on one and the sensor cubit up here. So far, so good. I require that phi be an eigenstate of, of the operator O in the middle. I require that I know its eigenvalue. I don't even think I wrote this on the slide. And I also require that phi have zero overlap with psi. 
if I if, if, if all of these things are satisfied, you can actually run through and check in the absence of noise, this x plus i y contains exactly the, or the expectation value of x plus i y contains exactly the same, uh, like the expectation value of O in the same way that uh, the control qubit contained the expectation value of O on the previous slide. Um, it's like a three liner, you, you'll have to trust me if you want, harass me afterwards and I'll do it on the board with you. Um, actually, I think I'm going to have the calculation a bit later on. Now, there are longer circuits. Um, I've hidden that here because the, uh, having a unitary which prepares a reference eigenstate from like the state one and zero from the state psi is not the same as just like this isn't just my, my say like my, my variational ansatz or something. Instead, what this circuit has to do now is actually has to kind of prepare the cat state. So you do like, you know, you do some GHC preparation with the fan out. And then usually you apply your ansatz circuit after that. In principle, you could probably replace the cat state preparation with uh, like, you know, because you can prepare a GHC state in, in distance two if you have, uh, if you have um, classical feedback. But you can't unfortunately do that for this new dagger. At least I know I know of no way of doing that. Um, and then you sort of, and and in any case, it's and, and then it's nice to have like kind of this new being about as symmetric as you could possibly get with. Um, and the cool thing, that, and I will say that the, the main thing that we like about this, and this really comes from the um, I guess this really comes from the, the fact that you're projecting yourself into such a small hill the hill space where you can hit your results, at least in uh, in, in simulation, when we first did this, it will show. It, it does show really good, um, like really good uh, error mitigation results. And you can see here. So this is this is actually the and the, the error mitigation power has depended a little bit on the circuits that we applied it to, and to the noise models we took, and to whether or not we did it with or without control. But you can see here that with control, we're we're still. And sorry, and I should say the thing that we're also kind of cool is that it is, is in, in seeing this asymptotic improvement. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm doing a simulation, and I'm just increasing or decreasing the error per qubit per per like you know, moment. So your know, error per qubit per instant of my circuit. Um, and then what we look on the the right hand side is look at the absolute energy error. And the cool thing here is you can actually see this is this this black line is actually a fit to like uh, to epsilon equals p squared. Whereas the red line is a fit, a fit of epsilon equals p, uh, epsilon equals p, and you can see without error mitigation, um, this this one you know it, it fits it fits quite well to linear. But this guy is a very good quadratic fit, and if you look at so this kind of comes back to the you know the error correction um, literature where people think about the the you know having an error mitigating code of say distance uh, three that can correct for or, or error mitigating code of distance two that can correct for all single qubit errors. Well, this is evidence that this is a you know a weird code. It would be a bit weird to call it a code, but it's correcting for all single qubit errors here. At least that's my claim. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm a bit out of time, but let me quickly go through virtual distillation, and then maybe we'll leave it there. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Okay. Let's go through virtual distillation, which is another form of error mitigation. Okay. So virtual distillation is another is a, is a results from. Um, Bill Huggins and also Valen Carso um, did, did a, uh, another, uh, another um, article at the same time. And this is a, a different type of, um, of, of uh, projection. Namely, instead of trying to project myself into a subspace or project myself onto like a, you know, a single state, I'm actually, I'm actually going the other way. I'm saying, okay, quantum states are mixed. Why don't I, uh, but, sorry, quantum state, noisy quantum states are mixed, but ideally quantum states are not mixed. Why don't I try to project a mixed state back to the boundary of the set of all pure states? Now, this is actually really challenging to do. The set of pure states is not well mapped out. If you could map out the set of pure quantum states, then you'd be solving QMA hard problems. So in general, we don't try to do this. Um, at least the interest, interesting pure states are typically QMA hard. Fine. Um, however, there is one way we can do this, which is via the power method. Okay. Because if I take a noisy density matrix row and I put it to the power of n, and then I have to divide it by its trace, um, then it turn, then this thing will, will limit to like row, like the outer kept row, sorry, it, it'll limit to a, a rank one density matrix where that density matrix where it corresponds to a state, which is actually the largest eigenvector of row. Okay. So all I need to do now is take powers of my density matrix and put them together. How do I do that? Well. We need to measure something. So now I need to like measure this thing traced with like, you know, trace it out and measure it with an observable in order to get the thing that I actually want. Um, and it turns out that this trace is the, the, this operator here, or sorry, the trace of, of O row N is equal to the trace of O 
times the per like the, the per cyclic permutation on n copies of rho. So this is like this is shown by this this like diagram or, or diagram up here. But this thing, this this operation here is a cyclic permutation. These are three copies of my state preparation. This is the um, this is the observable O, and you can kind of see if you trace this wire around that it will become you know observable times three copies of rho. Right. I guess what else we're going to say here. And the nice thing about here is that then for for a local two, if I have just local uh, local single qubit unitaries. Um, and everything else that I want to measure that's called the operator, I can always map to local single qubit unitaries. I can measure traces of O rho squared using just local two qubit gates. Um, this has one large remaining error, which is the drift in lambda from, from uh, U naught, which is uh, everything else gets suppressed exponentially in the number of copies, which is a nice result. Um, I guess I want to, so I'm going to have to skip through here. I'm going to finish on just some notes on, on how these things are. I'm going to skip through this just. Let me just uh, finish with some notes on experimental issues and open questions and, and maybe paint a, you know, the downside of this. The first downside and really the thing that, that I've hidden under the rug up till now is the sampling requirements of these two of these two error mitigation techniques. They are quite high, okay? We'd like to get them down. Now, one of the things that helps to talk about when you when you think about the sampling of a, or, or a sampling dos is to write down the circuit fidelity. I'm not gonna formally define this because I don't know a formal definition, but it's roughly something like, you know, the number, like the, the error rate per gate, one minus the error rate per gate to the number of gates in your circuit is a good way of estimating it. And it's roughly the success probability of your circuit. Now, if I write down F as the fidelity of my circuit, it's like the best I could possibly do. Um, then the sampling cost, this, you, you can make a decent argument that the best, the, the best error mitigation strategy you could possibly have should have a cost of fidelity to the minus one. Echo verification has a cost of fidelity to the minus two, which is not so great. We'd like to improve on that. Virtual installation actually has a cost of fidelity to the minus four when you work out all of the when you work out all of the details, which is even which is a pretty nasty cost. Um, there are furthermore, because I wrote in the previous uh, as I wrote in the previous slide, um, you know, I'm I'm only doing a single Pauli measurement, or I'm measuring like the expectation value of a single unitary. On my state row and every every other bit of information about row, I'm using that for the the verification. Now this means this is in contrast to when I'm doing, you know, like a standard variational ansatz experiment. I'm doing standard state tomography and I can measure all of my qubits and use all of the information on all of those to estimate different observables. This puts further tomographic restrictions on echo verification. It turns out you can't get around those, which asymptotically increases the number of measurements you need to take in n, like where n is a number of qubits. Um, also, the methods are more prone to anisotropic, oh, anisotropic blah, anisotropic noise. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, that needs this needs more study. I don't know any. I don't know anyone who's actually properly looked into studying anisotropic noise on uh, either of these um, methods. And finally, when you start taking a lot of measurements, your rescaling fidelity gets becomes prone to drift. Its estimates are unreliable. So that's the conclusion. We have some nice new techniques for error mitigation. Watch this space. We'll have a couple of new papers out soon. I was hoping to come out by the time we came to this conference, but it's, you know, it doesn't happen always. Um, they are pretty costly with regards to sampling requirements. We're working on that. Uh, they do demonstrate pretty good uh, error mitigation, including an experiment. We're working on that. Um, and that's about it. Oh, and I guess, uh, yeah, and I guess, you know, in case, uh, just just to follow on to the the, the claims that the point that every every other person was making, we are hiring, um, as everybody else is. We have actually got a job posting open up in Munich. If anyone's interested in working for Google, but still staying within the European Union or you know Europe in general, um, and and that's about it. Thank you all for your time. Is what sorry? Uh, so the question, yeah, yeah, sure. So I should repeat. I should repeat the question for people for the people online. The question was whether an echo verification on age assume the control qubit was clean. Um, the answer is kind of. So what you need. So if I have a deep, completely depolarizing channel on on here, right? If I have a completely depolarizing channel, then that will just further shrink me down and I can rescale. I rescale with that with a Lockschmidt echo. Um, if I have a, some kind of bias on it, like amplitude, amplitude damping noise, 
you can account for that by measuring in the plus X and minus X basis, and then just averaging those out, and that'll turn a amplitude damping channel into a depolarizing channel. Uh, if I'm picking up some coherent error from this, then that'll actually give me like that, that kind of turns this thing into a phase, which you can also correct. You can actually correct that again. Well, I guess rather you'll see the phase also on your, on your um, Lockschmidt echo. If that phase is kind of dependent on you doing O, then you have to be a bit more tricky about this. And I guess ultimately, as I mentioned, if you have like a drifting ancilla qubit, that's kind of like, you know, literally in time resolved, you're getting, you're seeing drift, you're very, you're very prone to that. So we're, we're immune to some noise, we're not immune to others. Uh, okay. yeah. Just before we finish, just like to say one or two more final, final words. So, um, firstly, thank you all very, very much for coming. It's been fantastic to have some of you here. And the final thanks, I guess, I'd like to give is to Louisa, who perhaps uh, come down to the front actually, if you don't mind. Sorry. Um, <laughs>